I really feel this is something we do all the time is we start to have the big dream. The seed starts to grow and we have an excuse why we don't want to let it. So, you know, there's, there's my pontification for the day and my advice for dreaming is let the big dream grow and then we'll figure out how to make it a reality. Don't kill it before it's born. Hello dreamers, my name is Lisa and I'm a DreamWork coach. Today we are here with Dylan White, who is a dream worker, a dream caster, and a wizard. So if you want to hear more about how Dylan is a wizard, check out the other video that we have on Dylan, all about being a wizard. Don't miss that. It's awesome. <laughs> so today we have an exciting topic, I think. Uh, this is one of my favorite things to talk about. And it is the power of daydream. Oh. So, if anyone watches my channel, you'll know that I, I say a lot that we don't just dream while we're asleep. We also dream while we're awake. And Dylan shared this incredible story of a very powerful daydream that he had once. It was very transformative for him. So I wanted to have him on here to share this story. And I just want to do a shameless plug right now that <laughs> I'm collecting stories like this for a documentary that I want to film um, at some point. In the future, this is like my bucket list item. So it's not something I'm rushing to do. I want to make sure I, I take time and gather the best stories. And I think Dylan's is a very good candidate. So I wanted him to come on here and share it with us. And if you out there have an awesome story similar to this or another story about dreaming in general that was so powerful, it changed the way you think about things or it changed your life, go to my website at thedreamworkcoach.com and uh, submit it there. You'll see a link for I think it says uh, documentary dream submissions. All right, so that is out of the way. Let's get on to Dylan. I think before we get started, um, if you want to share where people can find you um, on social media oh, yeah. right up front, uh, that would be awesome. <laughs> Go ahead. That, makes, that makes a lot of sense. So I'm <laughs> at Grumble Dude. And you can find me on Insta, you can find me on Twitter, you can find me on Facebook. I'm out on Clubhouse where we have our little dreamology uh, meetings every couple weeks. And that's a hoot. And uh, yeah, that's that's basically it. anywhere that I am. If you want to see if I'm there, do a search for Grumble Dude. And that's what will lead you to me if I'm there. And, oh, okay. yeah. If you look for me on, on, on YouTube, you'll find some really terrible videos that you can probably not <laughs> laugh at. So <laughs> Yay! I didn't know you had YouTube videos. Have I seen these? We'll have to link to that. We'll link. I'll yeah. put links to his stuff down below. And especially... Um, you know, the clubhouse thing I think is really neat. It's a podcast style. Um, it's like over the phone. There's an app called clubhouse that you can yeah. download and um, I'll put a link to their group down there. It's called, what is it called? Your group? I, it's the dreamology. Dreamology. Yeah. yeah so you just uh, get notifications when they're on there talking and uh, it's awesome. It's you, Bonnie Lee and Pamela Means three very awesome and wise dream teachers who <laughs> are all really fun to listen to. You guys really vibe really well together. So moving forward, Dylan, I think probably the best way to start is to start with your story, with your the daydream that you had. Sure, sure. That This is uh, one I'm trying to figure. Uh, I get all messed up. I'm, I'm not the best at math. It's go, coming up on 14 or 15 years ago now when I actually think about it. Mm -hmm. um it started with a really bad day and it was just just i i was inside my head nothing was going right but for whatever reason it was sunny it was the summer it was in july we decided to go down to the beach so the, the island basically has a few um summer or, um, or public beaches or swim places sand isn't common here but the one that we've decided to go to is one of the larger public sand beaches it's mm -hmm. called providence bay and it's, it's a really, it's a neat, uh, neat place. Uh, one of my favorite places on the island. So we drove down there and I don't know, I went out in the water and the best thing that I could think to do to entertain myself was just sort of float on my back. And you know how you can sort of get the water just at your ear level. So you're mm -hmm. not really in the outside world. And I probably had my sunglasses on too. So I had a bit of shade on my eyes, just trying to like drown everything out, I guess. And I started to go through a, a story in my head and this is something that's really interesting I suppose is like if you have an experience where you you go on a journey in a dream and it's very lucid and you're there then it feels like you know something and then the other end of that is something that's just this quietest little story in your mind 
the yell, you have to slow down all the other noise to even start to hear. Somehow that's what I was doing. I was tapping into that quiet story. Mm-hmm. And it started to tell me about going to the river Styx, kind of like in traditional Greek mythology, which is something that I'm sort of familiar with. And the idea is generally the ferryman, uh, Charon, or Charon, or however you pronounce it. I don't know because I live on an island and I'm not ancient. <laughs> ferryman, you'd usually have a coin for him. And for the coin, he would carry you to the other side over to uh, Tartarus or the world of the dead where you would get your reward or your punishment or whatever it was. I think bad people went to Hades. Heroes went to the Elysian fields. There's all different levels of it. I don't know. Like, okay, my Greek, ancient Greek is <laughs> mythology. <is> like, <laughs> but I, I knew this. Right? In, in my story, I didn't have a coin. And so I dove into the river Styx. Now, this is generally not considered to be a good thing to do because you lose all your memories traditionally when you do that. That's why I think it was, uh, is it Achilles? And his mom takes him as an infant and dips him into the river sticks. And that's what makes him immortal, except for his ankle, which he had to hold on to. And your baby, if you lost all your memories, who cares, right? So it's mm-hmm. useful. But as an adult, you lose all your memories. But for whatever reason, in, in this story, I would that would only happen to me if I was to open my eyes. I had to keep my eyes shut in the blackness. And I could feel like hands and and like the dead, basically, you know, like that classic you know, night of the living dead, the skin pulled back from the long fingernails oh, moving down your down your spine. Yeah. And it was sort of creepy, but they couldn't affect me as long as I didn't as, as long as I didn't glimpse into that, I'd be fine. And I went along like this for for a while. And I felt sort of like I was approaching something and it turned out to be a waterfall. And it was it was a quiet waterfall. And as I went over to it, over it, I was like falling and I was falling and I was falling and I was falling and eventually gently just came to rest in a little pond or the little little pond at the bottom of the waterfall, which wasn't as nearly as busy as the top for whatever reason. And I just quietly floated up to a shoreline and I could feel the reeds this time touching me on the back, like the, the way they grow on the shore is a very specific feeling. And at that point, I felt like I completed my journey. So I opened my eyes. It was a very bright day. And I could see this. I was literally looking at Providence Bay. And I felt transformed in a way like I was King Arthur. But the way that I hear that, I told you I like puns, is mm-hmm. author. Like somebody who's uh-huh. the author yeah. of their own story. Yeah. And there was my wife. And she'd been beside me. I didn't know this. Part of, we'd been, you know, things that happen in couples, right? So part of the grumpiness was us. And that was when we were pretty fresh in our relationship. We were pretty new at that point. Mm-hmm. So it, it turned out that the things I'd been feeling, those visceral things, she'd been tickling my back. Aww. And so they become part of my story. So yeah. the, the, the figures that I was interpreting and then later that that shoreline. And so again, we're talking about bridges between the, the waking world and, and the dream world. And after that, I was really transformed. It might be what some people would call the start of my crazy phase, like my really outwardly crazy phase. Um, we drove home that day and we come through this little town of Spring Bay. I told you, there's a little place called Bowie's General Store. Oh, yeah. Spring Bay. I literally Bowie's. used to live to Nice. Right? <laughs> we're literally driving by Bowie's General Store and the song comes on the radio, which is John Mayer, No Such Thing. You know, and she said to me condescendingly, there's no such thing as the real world. And this is what my wife at the time had channeled to me or what I'd heard is a message from her, which is, yeah, the whole world is bloody well made up. It's a bunch of stories that we tell ourselves everything from, from top to bottom. And I guess this is like, it certainly started to cause a conflict in me because it's like, why is there so much stress over time and money and what was written in old books and, 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 and so much like, like literally like what, like I went down the bad rabbit hole in that sense. Like I, I woke up to something, but didn't know what was happening. And then sort of like other things started to uh, like, I, so I learned about meditation and I'd never really done that before. And so there's, there's like the mnemonic induced lucid dream technique, the mild technique. Mm-hmm. At that time, I was unaware that I was tripping onto the wild wake induced lucid mm-hmm. dream technique, which is essentially if you just sit down and calm yourself down, your mind can visit other places. The very first thing that happened to me, and I'll, I'll, I'll say this, I'll be honest about this. I don't want to tell this as the, the first story of someplace that I had in my mind because it was completely me and I didn't really understand it and to this day it keeps me cross-eyed because 
it's it's still always understanding what our internal lexicon and metaphors are. But this is what happened to me. I was meditating and I suddenly found myself on a hill overlooking Jerusalem. And there was Jesus Christ giving me his hand. And that's really strange because I was raised an atheist and I've come to think of myself as an agnostic. I really need things to pass the rational test, test of firsthand experience. And now I literally had the firsthand experience of jumping into someplace completely abstract in my mind and being a character. And I was so startled by it that I jumped back to reality. And ever since then, when I meditate, I tend to have very small jumps with a flash of something. And then I get so excited by it. I end up jumping back to normal yeah. reality. But that opened up this realization to me, which is, and, and it's kind of funny because I would have conversations with my wife about this and I didn't know this. She can see things inside her head. Like when I think a thought or I'm conceptualizing something, it's like a mass of dark unmolded clay. And I have a sense of something and a feel for something. And I'm good at making those very blind things into real things. Like I made chain mail for two and a half decades based mm -hmm. on how felt and bringing those feelings into reality but little did i know that there are people literally with the capability when they visualize something they actually have a little vision of it in their head they literally perceive something it's That's not surprising a it's not it's, a it's surprising to me that you don't have that because you're such an artist you know i didn't know i didn't know that, that existed, oh yeah i didn't i can visualize know. like crazy <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> right? and, and, and so, I, and this is this thing, and I'm still get so excited about it because I'll, I'll slow myself down and I don't do this nearly often enough. I'll slow myself down and I'll see a meme in my head. Like literally that is better at composing fonts and images and text than yeah. I am. It's like, how the hell do you compose inside so well? I'm this like, is interesting. Like, Very interesting so tidbit to know. Because you know. the when it comes to daydreaming, um, so when it comes to daydreaming, the way that I think of it is like I'm I'm visualizing things. I'm like picturing them in my head, and I'm like letting myself just imagine. And I can I can feel like I'm there, you know. So it's interesting to me that in this experience that you just described, it was so vivid. Also, your eyes were shut half the time, which makes sense now if that's how yep. you kind of process things sometimes. Um, but I wonder if, like, do you think it was a lucid dream? Do you think that, um, it was like basically the wild method that you kind of slipped into there? Like, what do you think happened that day? That, I've been puzzling over that ever since. And this goes into the whole thing of like, what is reality? Mm -hmm. Like initially when I was trying to puzzle this out, I had to start wondering, did I drown? Yeah. And is like literally this the sense of rebirth that I step into an afterlife and since that point have I been going through an experience which is like a purgatory of sorts where I where it's like uh, like my energy the energy from my life was was so energetic for lack of a better term that into my death it is carried on believing that it is alive <laughs> Mm -hmm. you know and, and, and sort of skipping through and i've like essentially maintain a reality tunnel yeah. and, and but i had to come back and sort of like try and reconcile stuff like that and look for you know for example evidence or at the same time also not lead myself to a psychiatric hospital by getting into a state where my reality was 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 yeah. breaking down or you're walking so, around saying i'm dead i drowned yeah that would put you there pretty quick yeah <laughs> Someone that, would that, submit right? you. Yeah. <laughs> so the thing that I honestly came up with and, and that works for me is just being the author of my own story. And in a sense, what I'm talking about, maybe in a slightly abstract sense, is just awareness. I'm aware of what I'm doing when I'm telling myself a story about something. I heard a great version of it, or I saw a great version of it in a meme once where somebody was like, somebody was getting down on the fact that they used crystals and rocks. And they finally told somebody off. They said, get out of my space. I know I'm making up a story about this piece of soda light, but that's what allows me to focus my energy through the piece of soda light. So, you know, get off my toes and just let me do my magic the way I do my magic. Right. And so there it is. If you're aware of the story you're telling yourself, it's so much more empowering than following along a story where you're out of control. And there's like really distinct clues for that when you find yourself saying things like I had no choice. You, there's a huge fucking warning sign that something's going down like you always have a choice maybe yeah. the events that occurred you had no choice 
Maybe they were completely out of your control, like the worst nightmare. They were an accident. You could do nothing. You were carried through to it, but going out of it and your reference to it and the story you tell yourself about that thing is the difference between empowering yourself and living through it and, or the, the opposite of consuming yourself with a negative story, which just pulls you into uh, whatever kind of, you know, spiral that is one's growth and one's a descent. And so my choice was to, to start referencing that way and, and, and looking at things. And that's where I sort of was telling before we were talking before in the other, uh, the other cast, just about having those different lenses. Like today, I'm going to look at existence through the lens of someone who died. And tomorrow I'm going to look through the lens of art. And the next day I'm going to look through the lens of, oh, I've got to pay my bills today. Because <laughs> ah. we do have to do that stuff still. Because those things are also part of, like, it, it's in a, a balance between all those things. And that's like I was talking about the, the sign before that's half real and half, you know, and the whole idea of the liminal space. Like, everything comes back. Uh, there was some other thing that I don't know where we even got the idea from, but they said, just like in a mathematical sense, if you took the smallest thing that we understand to exist and the largest thing, so like a, a, a quantum particle and the extents of the universe as we know it, mm. the scale where we exist between those two points is almost the middle in terms of, uh, in terms of scale because it mm -hmm. scales up slowly. So naturally, we're already occupying middle ground. And then you start to trip on these philosophies about controlling your views of that middle ground. And, and then finding the middle way in your path and you get into like, I don't know, Confucianism and, mm. and uh, Buddhism and, and Taoism and, and all that stuff. And it starts to clue you in these ideas. They're just different ways to run your, your mind. I came across a book and it sounded so magical. I thought, oh, this is going to be it. I'm going to finally know spells that will make the air sparkle. And I went through it and I'm like, this is a goddamn psychology text. And am I ever grateful? <laughs> it because now I understand something about my mind and how I've been blocking my own ability to accomplish things because mm -hmm. I can finally interface with the psychology. It just happens to have this label on it because that's what attracted me to interface with it. For someone else, it may be chicken soup for the soul or for somebody else, whatever brings them comfort or wherever they find that message, it will come to them in the language they can interpret. Okay, let's go back to your experience. Something you said actually kind of <laughs> on a side note real quick, when you were saying that um, you wonder like, did I drown? And the rest of this is, you know, basically the afterlife. It reminds me, this is something that really trips me up sometimes. It reminds me of something that Robert said in one of his books about how um, like he can travel into the afterlife and find people and, you know, help them realize like it's time to move on or whatever, because mm -hmm. you can get stuck in this afterlife that yes. you think is real. Mm -hmm. And I always wonder, am I in one right now? Like, <laughs> right. how would I know if these people are truly like confused by it and truly don't know, they have no idea anything yeah. weird at mm -hmm. all. Like, am I yeah. in one? And then I start to think about all of these signs and synchronicities and why does chiromancy work? And what's it like, are these clues that I'm dead? Like, <laughs> it just totally like, it makes me trip out sometimes. Holy crap. But then you just have to accept it and move on. Like if I am, oh, well, it you is. know. It yeah, well, that's my reality. I'm here, for, I'm here for a reason. This was something as I mentioned before about being a wizard. Like when I was talking to my shaman, she said, "You've lived lots of lives," and I'm like, "That's great, but I only remember this one." Yeah. I, I, so I've decided this is my eight thousand eight hundred and eighty eighth life. Ooh, the number eight and again. It's a very special life because this is my origin story. I'm living my life for the first time. This is the story of how Dylan became the wizard. Yeah. This is where it all came from. And my story is unfolding day by day. And in, in that, in that light, it's so, so much more super empowering than some sort of like predisposed notion to something. Like every time we like singular things always concern me, mono, mono culture, mono, anything is always like, I've always said um, isms really mm -hmm. scare me. Anything that you can describe in terms of an ism is like a prison. Uh, you know, like socialism, capitalism, whatever ism, because it's a singular way of looking at something. And we don't seem, there's no evidence for anything that we, the, 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 uh, we know of as existence is being singular in that sense. Like there's the great wholeness of everything and whatever that is. But beyond that, there's all these little individual parts and like it's the diversity of our world, which makes it really special. There's no one race, there's no one person, there's no one thought, there's everything. And like, 
you take something like feeding ourselves, like just the food system. You think, oh, well, you grow potatoes in the field and that's all that there is. But what, cons what constructs a field? Or what, con what, what does a field consist of? The last I heard, there was over 50 billion known kinds of fungus alone wow. that comprise our soils. Mm -hmm. There's an entire system there. And it's every one of those little pieces, like the food chain can sometimes you can lose this, you can lose that. But overall, it's a chain. All of those things are literally and fundamentally connected. And there's something mm -hmm. to that. Like that, that's, yeah. that's telling us something about our, like that, that's there for us to learn from. Mm -hmm. How else do we know what we are if we can't look and say, well, this is what gives us our breath of life, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it, it just... <laughs> Can go down like so many rabbit holes, like so far like, on that. My topic. mind's a rabbit like, warren. I find it feel like my, my mind's not a rabbit hole, it's a warren. There's an yeah. watch out for the <laughs> I don't always like visitors. <laughs> it's nuts. Okay, so going back to your um, experience, um, can you tell us, like, I mean, you definitely just kind of did, but to put it in black and white, like more, yeah. you know, condensed terms. How do you think that this experience, let me just summarize. Let, let's sure. do lightning dream work with this. Jesus, yeah. what are we, okay. are we dream teachers or not? <laughs> use our tools, use oh. our tools. Yes. Okay, <laughs> we'll use our tools. Sure. Can you give it a title, this experience? Yes. Well, Providence Day. Providence Day, all right. And you already told us what happened, so I will Again, summarize to make yes. sure I, I gathered this correctly. So mm -hmm. you were in kind of a funky mood uh, and you and your wife were going to Providence Bay. Yes. Which is the only sandy beach, I believe. It's, that the, you it's the easiest to access and nicest. Okay. Just a nice yeah. beach. Yeah. It's um, and you get into the water and you're kind yeah. of floating. Um, you get your ears. Up. So this is interesting to me, too, because have you seen Fringe, the show Fringe? No, I keep hearing about it. When they're in this, uh, they go into the sensory deprivation tank where they're floating and they can't hear anything and their eyes are shut. So mm -hmm. you kind of, in a way, had yourself in yep. this little sensory yep. deprivation yep. moment where you're floating, your ears are underwater and you have sunglasses <laughs> on um, and you start to visualize and see yourself um, floating down the river sticks, but yep. you don't have a coin. So yep. you feel, and you're feeling people grabbing at you underwater, a very creepy moment. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Were you creeped out, I wonder, at the time in the dream? Was it um, creeped out or were you just observing? Boy, it's hard to... Sometimes things like that happen where I just have this fundamental knowledge mm -hmm. of how to approach it. It's just like, well, you if you if you open your eyes, you're going to be consumed by this. So keep yeah. them shut. Just keep the, the journey going. And yes. when I entered to that, and I, well, like if I'd opened my eyes, I just would have saw a sunny day and been in the bed. Right. And the story had to get to the end to have the impact. Mm -hmm. So it was telling me not to ruin the story. And I decided to listen to it. I didn't ruin my story and my journey. Excellent. So then you get to the end of the river by a waterfall. And yeah. that's when you finally wake up. Right. Yeah. And exactly. your wife is there and she's like tickling your back and stuff. And you're like, oh, that must, must have been what I felt, which I noticed yeah. too in night dreams too, that can happen. If you hear a sound mm -hmm. like your radio is going off to wake you up. It's very yeah. easy to incorporate that, incorporate that into it. Yeah. Yes. I didn't wake up because I was just thought it was part of the dream. Yes. yes. <laughs> so in a nutshell, yeah. is that basically what happened? Yeah, that's basically it. And when I woke up, I for the feeling, I felt under utterly transformed. And mm -hmm. and what I felt I was looking at was Avalon, my Avalon. This is mm -hmm. this is my island. And the my wife was my queen, my Guinevere. And so how did that um, well, okay, let's see. I'm going to skip ahead here. How did that okay. feeling kind of overflow then into your life uh, to this day? So Every you went point. into that day just feeling like bumbly. And so then you're happy at the end of the day. But how did like on a deeper level, like how has yeah. that transformed you? Yeah, it just changed everything. Like there was nothing that was the same. The fund like everything was fundamentally changed. And it also gained a determination to keep changing myself. Bec and it's like initially I was induced to believe that that was the only change I would ever experience. And it turned out that it was just a, a huge shift that was going to be one of many, many uh, aftershocks that were going to come and challenge me in all sorts of ways that I couldn't even imagine. But it fundamentally changed me. I was not the same person who went into the water. I was, I was reborn as a more aware and more willing, uh, uh, more willing to face myself. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it's been a really interesting journey because 
I really messed up along the way. And like, I, I got lost, like I said, in some dark rabbit holes mm -hmm. and got consumed by things. And so to come back out of it and even have to be able to reflect on it and go, wow, um, it's only now that I'm even starting to gain awareness. Like I said, I went through a crazy phase. It was like literally five years where I could do nothing but sit and write really weird books that nobody's ever read. I had no capacity to sell, even though I was sure if just the right people could see them, the whole world would change and everything would be all right. And just like, like the bad daydreams, the, the ones like the, and when I say bad, I guess there's no word for a nightmare version of a daydream, but the way that I, I, I felt the, uh, the good description for a nightmare was, is it's a night dream that's out of control. Mm -hmm. So a daydream that's out of control is one where that idea is completely taking over your life without your awareness of what's happened. And, and that was what would happen to me. Like I just had these amazing ideas and I was so convinced it was just the one thing that we had to do that was going to change everything. And to the point where people around me were really being, challenge to even put up with me and my wow. you know oh good lord dylan's and another one of his crazy schemes and we're actually going to have to entertain his energy because he's going to be really enthusiastic and manically excited about this thing as well yeah, yeah it was it was a very <laughs> it was a very embarrassing time like i i it, and obviously there was a lot for me to work to and it helped when i finally got into the shadow stuff because that's where it all was and it was funny too because i started to and like I had a whole analogy, analogy going one time as our mind is being very much like the crystal that powers a lightsaber. Mm -hmm. And depending on your type of crystal, it will form the type of blade you have. And maybe that's even reminiscent of like auras that people can carry. Interesting. And so I would, I would view myself as a crystal. And at one point I realized I had done very good at clarifying this crystal, but there were still problems with it. As at certain angles, there were still shadows and imperfections that I didn't know how to work out. And it took years of digging to understand the effect of those things, subconscious behaviors that I could have never even hoped or had a chance with if I hadn't been willing to really face up to a lot of stuff and go, oh, good grief. Like I remember this time and now I see the wake of what I did and what I, and oh, holy crow there's a lot to uh, there's a lot to go back and own in that thing yeah it sounds like you really are in a lifetime of like an origin story you know it sounds like you're in a very transformative full entire life like your whole life sounds like you've been really like you've gone through long periods of transformation and like to be able to look back and be like oh my gosh I, I used to be like that like you've come a long way I can relate oh, yeah. to a lot of that um all right I was gonna say something I totally lost, forgot so it must not have been important. Nice. <laughs> So we'll, we'll just go ahead and move on. Yes. Um, okay. So this, I mean, I just, I'm trying to wrap my head around how to explain how cool this is, like an experience like this, that it can happen to anybody. Because most people, if they watch this and they're even able to comprehend what we're talking about, <laughs> because they're yeah. like daydreaming, what? What do you mean? Yes. Like that it, they can do it too. And I'm wondering if you have like any advice on how someone, it's very similar to journeying, you know, yes, um, and just letting your imagination yeah. go. Just like your in, imagination. in your yeah. example, you didn't really have an intent because it was spontaneous. No. Yes. But like if someone really was like, man, I'm really down in the dumps. I really need something transformative. I just need an experience. Like, did you have any advice on how someone might be able to pull that off? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's why I chose this background today, as a matter oh, of fact. Nice. <laughs> I, well, it's kind of interesting. Like in Doctor Who mythology, there's the TARDIS, which is where I am. This is the control room of the TARDIS. This is where Doctor Who travels in time. Mm -hmm. And the amazing thing about a TARDIS is that it stands for time and relative dimensions in space. Essentially, it's bigger on the inside than the outside. And it doesn't necessarily move anywhere. It's just open a door to where you want to go in space and time. So in, in one way, to me, it's completely analogous for my mind. My mind is much bigger on the inside than it is on the outside. Like it's limited here, but on the inside, it's, it's infinite. And the more I feed it, the bigger it can get. So there's, there's something like this interesting characteristic. And I kind of like to think of it as a what if machine that responds, like for me, just personally asking what if questions generates the most interesting responses. Like seriously, I did a what if once and I birthed a, like, uh, what I call an omniverse. So you have a universe and a universe exists as one of many multiverses, 
but the thing that contains all the multiverses is an omniverse, Ooh. right? Because it's omni. It's the the thing that can. Not that there couldn't be many omniverses. I was going to say. I was just going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> What's omniverse. many omniverses called? <laughs> right. But I had I had an entire <laughs> omniverse basically wake up inside of myself for one question in the what if machine, and it was really simple. And to this day, like it's it's become part of my self referential inner mythology. But here, here's here's my real trick for it. I, I got a trick, and I stole this one completely from Robert. And here's an exact example of the kind of person I am. He was talking about his book called Dream Big Dreams or something like that. Mm -hmm. And as opposed to like actually reading it, I just stole the title for one of my own little observations on something. And, and this is a story about like the dreamer and the critic. Mm -hmm. As a daydreamer, I love to just go off on a wild daydream and see something which is huge and expansive. And the thing that consistently spoils that for me is the critic sitting in the corner saying that will never get off the ground. There's not enough fuel. There's circumstances that are against that. By the way, there's a law of gravity, so you can't really do that with a rocket, by the way, or something else like the interject reality. Most often for me, and this is one of the things I've noticed is like, like a toxic infection is there's no reason to pursue that idea because you don't know how to make money off of it. And I, that one, I'm so toxic with that one. I, I've been doing my best to expunge it, but that critic still shows up all the time. Mm -hmm. So I've come, to, I've come to an agreement at this point which is you allow me to dream the big dream, which is means I have the dream and I let it grow to the farthest extent that it wants to grow to. And then when I'm ready, you and I are going to sit down because critic, you're the best editor I have. You're the one who knows how to take that information and actually bring it into something which is reasonable. So the, I think I used an example in one of our podcasts. I said, like, one of Dylan's ideas is I need a choir of 100,000 angels. We need the planet Jupiter. And, okay, we're going to need an entire sea of Coca-Cola. Okay? <laughs> and it's like, so that's, that's the dream I want to bring to life. So when I sit down, if the critic's like, okay, that can't happen on many levels, right? But yeah. if I have the big dream, I see the whole vision, then I sit down with that critic and I was like, okay, how are we going to make this happen? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to put out a thimble and there's going to be a speaker underneath it. And that's our representation of 100,000 angels in a choir. For Jupiter, I have a hubcap and a can of glittery spray paint. And in terms of the sea of Coca-Cola, there's a bird bath. And I'll, I'll spend the $2 a budget on pouring <laughs> you know, in some Coca-Cola. And maybe at the end of the show, I'll throw in a Mentos to make a mess so it's funny. And so there's how... And something that is so necessary because I really feel this is something we do all the time is we start to have the big dream. The seed starts to grow and we have an excuse why we don't want to let it. Now, it's not to say that it, we couldn't develop a pause button. You couldn't say to the dream like, oh, you're a big dream. Would you mind waiting a couple hours? I really have to finish my homework or my noodles or whatever it is. That's fine. But come back, allow the dream to go and then let the critic. And I, I, I honestly feel like I could make like some kind of grand statement. Like if the majority of the people in the world who are making decisions went from that angle at allowing the dreams to grow and then figuring out how to do them practically, we'd be in a lot better position than it appears that we're in at this point. So, you know, there's, there's my pontification for the day and my advice for dreaming is let the big dream grow and then we'll figure out how to make it a reality. Don't kill it before it's born. Mm -hmm. I like that. That's actually very practical advice. So mm -hmm. if, it, if I were like, oh man, I just could really use uh, a little assistance here. I could even incubate, you know, a daydream and say like, I need, you know, to dream big on uh, my career or something. Yeah. And then let myself relax and start letting my imagination go wild and really wild <laughs> is yeah. what you're suggesting. And yeah. I love it. Let it like yeah. there are no limits. And that I feel like when you take all of this into consideration and put it into the context of uh, the law of attraction, it makes so much sense because it's That's a vibration. You know, it's getting into that positive vibration and daydreams can do that for you. And also yeah. point out where your limitations are. Your critic pops That's up. And so you have exactly. to know that. You have to know what your critic's saying in order to shut them up. <laughs> One of our uh, original Clubhouse conversations is, well, what is a dream? And I, I, I wanted to be very wizardly. So I said, well, what isn't a dream? And then that, that really sparks that, that bigger conversation because, well, you can't find anything that isn't a dream. That's so in true. That, in, that, in that broader picture, right? <laughs> yeah. And, and 
and the the thing about it is that if you really allow yourself to feel those dreams, like this is what we came back to is dreams are feelings. Ultimately, what we're talking about in the imaginal realm, whether you're, you're perceiving it in a mental engine or you're just feeling it like I mostly do, dreams are feelings. And to, to bring them into reality is to turn them into something tangible is the magic. But you start with a feeling. You're looking for a feeling. So if you want the feeling of your future career, for example, and you don't even allow yourself to feel really feel what that is how can you send that internal guidance mm. engine the message because when you say something like i want money well that's just it's just an abstract well you could say i want money for a reason now you're just creating a condition and a complication to something and you're not sending a clear message to whatever can make that happen but when you really let yourself feel it i started doing this and i left myself in tears because i did something that i had never done i allowed myself to feel good about something that i didn't think was possible mm -hmm. in terms of a whole bunch of stuff in my life between living or just you know this is my bucket list living on a podcast with a professional youtube broadcaster isn't this just the most amazing thing right here i am living the thing that i visualize and i can really feel it and mm -hmm. I, I feel like allowing myself to have those feelings is what allowed or opened or facilitated this happening. Before this, mm -hmm. I couldn't really, I feel like my energy would have ruined this in some sort of way because you can also attract that sort of thing. If you're not ready for something, you can create a storm around yourself that will protect you from it. And right, believe so, because that's what you asked for. You mm -hmm. wanted to shield, you wanted to protect it. So that day, you know, instead of, um, you know, Lisa's coffee cup and mouse pad showed up, but the laptop, <laughs> you, 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 know, <laughs> you know, the computer was, you know, the, yeah. and, and that's basically how it would happen. And it would be, your hard drive would have crashed. And I, I don't mm -hmm. mention before doing, uh, connecting very strongly with uh, technology. And that's how a lot of things would express myself. There was the morning I told you I talked to a shaman. I nearly knocked at the internet. I was so excited. I was writing to her an hour before the meeting. Like, I'm sorry, I don't think I'm going to make it. The internet's down. And I had to take a deep breath and allow the space to happen before I could even make the connection. Mm -hmm. And there's a, there's a lot of stuff like that. You know, when you feel like everything's going wrong and, and it's really it's probably because we're generating some sort of field that's protecting us. It's, it's a mm -hmm. good thing, even though we feel rotten about it. We didn't yeah. really mean it face fender on the highway but it protected us from something else that we did you know i really didn't want to go to that meeting that would have opened up my career mm -hmm. on some level you know i was afraid of it for some reason and it will attract stuff like that and, it, and it's strange because i think there's a lot of buzz that goes around that whole law of attraction thing that just goes off into what would be labeled as positive toxicity these days or something mm -hmm. like that or toxic positivity is what i've been accused of when mm -hmm. i try to talk about how i will motivate myself like something really shitty just happened and i'm going to tell myself a really empowering story about this and people are like are you freaking nuts like <laughs> your car's in the lake and you know your, your parents are canceled and you know yeah. like this is really terrible and it's like i refuse to look at it this way because mm. i know i could look at it the other way yes i could and that would just feel shitty i'm gonna instead yeah. i'm gonna be a wizard and i'm gonna rewrite my reality and that's mm. sort of the story that i learned on the beach that day was the the power of being able to do that like and and it gets into a whole story like if you really want to get into deep philosophy about free will maybe i never could change any of the events of my life except for my attitude towards them there was the thing I did have the ability and it's it, like, it's one of those things that really tests my patience when you come up with an attitude, which is somebody who's uh, possessing, like, I can't change something or it's out of my control to change something because mm -hmm. at that point you're attracting that, that thing to yourself. You're attracting yeah. something that you can't change because you're literally saying it out loud that you can't change it. So it's going to manifest for you. And it's a subtle thing. And it sounds like, like I always use the word woo woo. It sounds like sparkles and crystals and things that you want to write off as a bunch of new age BS, but it's like, mm -hmm. there's a really practical lesson here. Like there's something deep. We went deep into the rabbit hole before this is this deep <laughs> and it's because it's so simple and it's still on the surface. We look so deep for it and it's mm -hmm. right under your yeah. Well, I can't see under my nose. This is the best place. If you want to hide something from me, I can't see it. <laughs> yeah. and it's, I can't because I'm on right? a camera. But that's on the screen, reason. right? <laughs> but you're trusting the camera, you're trusting the technology to actually yeah, I know. show under your nose, right? You can't <laughs> yeah. see under your nose without a mirror. It's and true. you're just here to show your reality. You can't time. see my face so at all without any of that. Yeah. Right. You can't see your own eyeballs. So, right. Maybe part of even how we see ourselves, like how beautiful I see myself in the mirror is literally how beautiful I see my heart is. Mm -hmm. I look in 
And, you know, you see me and, and, and I don't know, and we don't know if we have the same colors and the same language. You might see a glowing radiant angel with a lion's head. That's, <laughs> starship and you can't believe that's definitely what got, i see <laughs> you can't believe you got this this interview you know and on yeah. my side I see this amazing you know dream uh, goddess who's you know lending me wisdom on how to be a wizard or, or, or <laughs> but like the the you know the, the the gulf between what we call real and what is real is i don't mm-hmm. know I'm lost now and this is how complex the story is it's so simple it's, mm-hmm. it's it's right there for us, and we always want to go and make it deep and find a reasoning, and we're and we're so sure, and and maybe it's a lot more simple than that. Maybe it's right on the surface for us to find. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty wild, like that we have this these tools right at our disposal of being able to shift and change our reality. And it works. It works for so many people that you can't just write it off. You know, like that's the part that blows my mind and also yeah. makes me think I'm dead. <laughs> like, this is, this, this this is reality the- is so like flexible. This can't be reality. You know, it just feels so very dreamlike. Yeah. That, that's um, it. I, I was, so, so like, I'm sure the hard reality is all there is. And I'm so, I'm so shocked to discover that it's actually much more mutable than I could have ever imagined. I know it's, in, it's crazy. I yeah. think a big key that you touched on too, is that, um, and we learned this in our dream teacher training about bringing dreams to this reality. So the same goes for daydreams, right? So yeah. you were saying like your piece of advice is to dream big and then bring a piece back. And, yeah. um, I think that is, huge. Like, even if it's like filling up a bird bath with a uh, two liter of Coke, because I feel <laughs> exactly. like the act of doing that or just drawing a dream or, you know, making a bumper sticker, a lot of the other common yeah. ways just, of just, being oh. active with dreams, it, it kind of like trains your um, subconscious to believe it's real. Even if it's little, okay. it's the act of bringing it alive that you're spending the time and the energy, you're kind of telling yourself, I'm serious about it. You know, like I'm serious. This is exactly what I want to happen. I'm making it happen. And then like allow yourself to actually feel as if it's real. I think that's a huge key that we can all use to like tap into our daydreams and our night dreams, you know, bring those to life too. It's cathartic too. Like Mm -hmm. I I live through uh, a dream very viscerally, viscerally like a daydream of something that uh, I felt would be really important to me, which was as opposed to like just feeling something like winning the lottery I really allowed myself to feel what it would be like to give to my community mm-hmm. I, I I really focused on that and I mm-hmm. left myself in tears with a huge realization about the fact of, of ways that I don't allow myself to feel joy on a regular basis I would normally never allow myself to imagine that I could do something that I would feel was that that wonderful and be able to give in that way so I blocked myself off from even imagining that that real sensation is there and then I went and touched it and I went there's a real channel there I could feel good in doing that that's Mm -hmm. that's 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 different and and then then it it really starts to take on a reality where before it was something that was much more ephemeral and you couldn't you know it's like the you know the weird things that you're trying to grab on (laughs) they're not you know you can't quite get a grip on them when you got a feeling like that and you can go wow then that's a dream that you can really follow. And it's when it's mm-hmm. worth manifesting in reality. Like I have lots of what I'd call shit dreams that are, are wonderful. They're messages for me or they're whatever. I, I, I don't know. They amuse me. So, so great. I get a smile out of them, right? Mm-hmm. I bring one life a day and it seems that I have a community that enjoys sharing just abstract dreams without any like really great purpose to them. And so mm-hmm. there's like, this is my way that I can do it. But like as a larger entity, being like the living embodiment of dreams and doing these things like it's, it's interesting we talked about the character of charon well that's what you call a psychopomp and a psychopomp's job traditionally was ferrying those souls that didn't know they had died to the other side i actually had a dream about this it was one of the most amazing dreams i ever had and to me the perfect analogy for the sensation of ultimate chiromancy i called it um me becomes death and basically, I, I woke into a dream where I'd been inside the job of being death for the night wow. that death wanted the holiday. 
Mm-hmm. And what that involved was just being dragged around the world at lightning speed because death doesn't need like an invitation. They just show up where they need to be. And mm-hmm. that's chiropractic is being where you need to be when you need to be there and recognizing mm-hmm. that. So essentially I was just like summoned all around the world and one by one, I'd recognize somebody who was dying and I'd give them the best hug they ever had. And in that hug, their spirit went to where it needed to go. And I knew that I had done my job in ferrying them. Like I had a complete sense of utter and 100% job satisfaction. There I was, I was doing my thing. I could, I, it was, it was all so natural. And then like I watched a, a young lady and her family was devastated in an apartment in someplace like Philadelphia. She sat up from her couch and died of an aneurysm. And then it was a car accident and then it was an old person and then it was a stillbirth. And basically I was dragged around, you know, and it was the best dream. Okay. Top three dreams. I told you about the, you know, you are a magic dream. Yeah. Well, the, the, the one where I'm ferried around and I just know, like it, that complete sense of knowing. And so that's why I've tried to bring through my chiromancy is feeling the same thing. Mm-hmm. I actually have been a psychopomp when it came to my own dad's passing. I, I went through a very extended period of palliative care for him. And it turns out that it was not nearly as easy to manifest that embrace in the real world as it was in the dream world. But I'm really glad that I followed through on that and, and played that role. It's very interesting to, to actually go ahead and touch that transition and see something like that and experience that as, as something for real. And there's, you know, is a sense how I ended up honoring that dream, even though I wouldn't at the time have known that's what the story was going to be many years later. Well, but yeah, when I mean, we get the dreams we need when we need them, you know, like it, maybe that was the whole point of having that awesome yep. dream. Was in, not hoping to never have to bring it into the world, you know, a dream like that, but I mean, it sucks. Death is a part of life. (laughs) Well, it's funny because I ended up realizing, like I shared the Bruce Willis dream with you. Yeah. It was basically the same technique I used on the evil enchantress, like the hug of love Mm -hmm. when you, you know, and there's like my, my ultimate dream defense when it's the worst monster, when it's the worst situation, when your worst nightmare is facing you right in the eyes and you can smell it and feel it, give it a really big loving hug and embrace it as part of mm-hmm. yourself. And that is the most magic transform, uh, transformation that uh, or transformational experience that I've ever come across. It, there might be others. I'm sure that mm-hmm. there are. But that's the most transformative I've ever come across. And that's my default. I had a really bad nightmare a few nights ago. I talked about that in one of the dreamologies. And I used the exact technique. And I ended up waking up gently in my own bed instead of like starting out and falling on the floor. And I was like, oh, this is neat. And then afterwards, that lightning dream work, I just, it was the middle of the night. I went to the bathroom and I'm like, I'm no way I'm letting my worst nightmare rule any part of me. First thing, that dream gets a title, how to turn a bad dream around. Now, Mm -hmm. all of a sudden, I'm in control of it, and it doesn't own me anymore at all. And then Mm -hmm. I went work through it. I knew what it was telling me. I figured out how to honor it, and I I went forward with it. And and there it is. And that's the that's the real intensity or the real empowerment that comes out of realizing that you're the one that's writing your story. Because I could have taken the same experience and still be and reliving it over and over. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I think. We are going to wrap up this video. I really uh, appreciate you being here. I want to give you a chance to share your socials again and um, oh, yes. the clubhouse and stuff. So go ahead and tell people where they can find you and learn more about you. Excellent. I'm I'm out there in, in the interwebs as at Grumble Dude. Like I say, it, I always slur it for some reason. So you can do the little pop up at Grumble Dude thing. And you can find me everywhere. I'm, I'm prolific. And every time there's a new platform, I tend to hook myself up to it to see what I could do. Like, seriously, if you went onto TikTok and found at Grumble Dude, three videos, but one of them is one I did to honor a dream. So like, the, the, you guys, uh, <laughs> the main ones are Insta and Twitter. And I, I do most of my social connections on Facebook because where I am is a bunch of old fogies, I guess. Oh, did I say that out loud? Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, the, you know, the, the Facebook is popular where I am. So it's where I do a lot of my communication. And I'm really hoping to start doing my consultant wizard thing soon. Yes. I, I, I'm working on like right now, like I'm also part of the reason why I'm talking to you from my bedroom with the, uh, yeah, the beautiful the wallpaper. Tardis. Well, you're in your bedroom. Tardis. I thought you were on the TARDIS. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> my bedroom is the TARDIS. Nudge, nudge, wink, wink. <laughs> Thank you more. Uh, it's because my actual, like, my normal stage is in a complete st- it's, um, state of disarray as I'm trying to figure out what I'm doing with my life at this stage. So basically, <laughs> you know, rewriting everything and putting it together. And, you know, 
any feedback or helpful tip for wizards is always appreciated. <laughs> Anything to, you know, further my wizardly journey. I'm awesome. Let me yeah. know when you get your Ask a Wizard up and running and I will have I will. you back on here and I will ask the nice. wizard. <gasps> you will ask the wizard. It. Okay, it's a deal. Yeah. It's a deal. <laughs> Now I got something to look forward to. Now I got some real juice. Excellent. Me too. Thank I'm you. gonna think about what I would ask a wizard. This is exciting. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dylan, for being on here and giving us some tips on how we can all use daydreaming um, to basically better our lives. Wow. Well, our thank you. This has been great having you. You literally here. made my my. I don't know. This is the best thing that's happened this year thus far in a year of really yeah. good things. So, oh, that's excellent. awesome. <laughs> gonna keep going up. So excellent. It's been wonderful. And we'll talk again, I'm sure. Thanks All for right. having me. Yeah. Bye. Bye.